Um, Hello, uh, my name is uh, JP Paredes and I'm the program coordinator for Rural Prep. I will be providing technical assistance for today's webinar. If you need to ask questions at any time during the webinar, please use the chat box. If you hover near the bottom of your screen, a ribbon will appear. Click on the chat option and the chat box will appear. You can move the box to a convenient place on your screen or simply close it to avoid obstructing your view of the presentation. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please use this chat box and select all panelists and attendees from the drop down menu. Note that all questions in the chat box will be saved and curated for discussion at the end of the event. If the slides appear too large on your screen, such that some text appears to be cut off, please click near the top of your screen on view options. Then click on fit to window. We would also like your feedback on today's event. After the webinar, I will provide the link to the webinar survey evaluation in the chat box. The, sur the survey link will also appear in one of the slides at the end of the webinar. A reminder to our panelists, Please mute yourselves when you are not speaking during the webinar. Thank you for attending today. I will now introduce our facilitator, Dr. Davis Patterson. Hello, JP. And uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining today. And, and uh, I'm gonna be joined uh, later. Well, uh, Dr. David Schmitz is, is here with us and he'll be joining me later for facilitating the discussion. Uh, I I'm really pleased to welcome um, Dr. Camille Sherman and um, our other presenters from uh, University of North Dakota to talk about targeted rural health education. So um, I'll start with a, a, a few preliminaries and then we'll have the presentation followed by a chance for um, all of you to participate. Um, and as uh, JP mentioned, if you have questions at any time, uh, feel free to enter them in the chat box and we'll get to them when we get to the discussion. So uh, just a brief word about Rural Prep. If you don't know, know who we are, we are funded by HRSA um, and that stands for the Collaborative for Rural Primary Care Research Education and Practice. Um, and this is part of HRSA's initiative to establish academic, uh, academic units across the country to promote evidence-based practice in primary care education. Um, our mission is to improve and sustain rural health through community engagement and research in rural primary care health professions education. And we do that in uh, three main ways. One is we co conduct research and we also um, sponsor or, or try to stimulate research by others. Um, we uh, are developing a community of practice, which we consider you, you, all of you a part of. Um, of like-minded uh, stakeholders um, who, who share this mission. mission. And then we um, disseminate evidence-based uh, practices. Um, these webinars are really part of um, trying to strengthen our community of practice around this goal. Um, we do these webinars four times a year, and so this is June, and I'll be telling you at the end about our upcoming webinar in July, um, but these are on the fourth Thursday of those months. And they're really for just about everybody in this field, um, educators, uh, faculty, students, residents, and, and others. So the objectives of our presentation today, um, we're gonna be, uh, our, our presenters are gonna be identifying informational sources and potential topics for student-led writing activities um, to expose them to rural health issues um, and also help rural communities learn about themselves. Um, and then uh, they'll be talking about creating a mechanism to connect students with a writing expert for editing and identifying opportunities to make students aware of the tree or targeted rural health op education opportunity. Um, and so um, I'm going to hand it over in a, in a second here to our presenters, Dr. Sherman, um, Dr. Miller Temple, and, uh, and Stacy Kuthler at uh, North Dakota. University of North Dakota and the North Dakota Center for Rural Health. And again, um, remember to use the chat box if you have any um, questions while they're presenting or afterward. So I'll hand it over to uh, our presenters. 
Hello everyone. So I'm saying good morning from Dickinson, but I realize that uh, in the mountain time zone, so good afternoon for some of you. Um, this targeted rural health education project is uh, definitely something that's a team effort here at University of North Dakota. We can go to our next slide. So um, we will uh, introduce our team here. I'm Camille Sherman. I've worked with our Rural Opportunity and Medical Education Program for third year students and our third year family medicine clerkship for about five years now. Before that, I was in broad-based family practice in rural North Dakota. Um, and the others on my team here are Dr. Schmitz. If you'd like to give a little summary, Dr. Schmitz, and then we can move to our team connecting on the opposite side of the state in Grand Forks, North Dakota today. Thank you, Camille. This is Dr. Dave Schmitz. I'm the chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of North Dakota. I'm on the road today for residency graduations, somewhere between uh, Bismarck and Minot, North Dakota, uh, and then joined by the rest of our team from Grand Forks. This is actually how we typically do business, believe it or not, is all across the state. I'm Dr. Kay Miller-Temple, and I'm a primary care physician for about 30 years at the bedside and then transitioned recently um, with a master's in healthcare, or excuse me, master's in journalism and mass communication. I am the web writer for Rural Health Information Hub here in North Dakota. And I'm Stacy Kuzler. Hello, everyone. I'm the workforce specialist. I work for the Center for Rural Health, which luckily is located right here in the School of Medicine. I'm able to uh, walk across the hall to meet with Kay, and I'm able to walk down the hall to or down the floor to the next floor and see Dr. Schmidt. So uh, we're all one big happy family, just like North Dakota in general is. <laughs> okay, next slide. So just to really reiterate, um, our, our efforts here to pull this off take a, a team. So we've got our Center for Rural Health, we've got the Family and Community Medicine Department, Rural Information Hub, and North Dakota Rural Health Association is an important partner for us. One of the things that has been a real asset for us is connecting with our state health association. So um, this is an effort to develop connections among all of these entities but remember that your state rural health association can be uh, a piece of this. All of our critical access hospitals need to have a community health needs assessment done. That's part of the Affordable Care Act. It's a, it's a requirement. And so what we have been looking at doing here is pulling out the critical access hospitals and asking our students and our learners in those communities to identify a topic off that community health needs assessment that can certainly benefit the rural communities. And then as we, as we progress through our slides here today, you'll kind of get to hear how each entity is pulled in. So as we move on to our next slide here, Dr. Schmitz can kind of explain how this actually grew. Well, thanks, Camille. Yeah, I was actually a faculty and residency program director in the state of Idaho, working out of the big city of Boise. But we really had a rural mission at that time as well and realized that having an understanding of community needs would help our uh, training physicians, our family physicians in training to be able to meet those community needs and really develop a sense of community engagement. And so when I learned that uh, hospitals such as critical access hospitals were already networking in their, in their uh, communities to identify focused uh, community needs or to be able to access those community needs assessments in a more formal way, I thought to myself, I wonder if there's a way that we could get our learners who are out in um, rural rotations or having a rural preceptorship to be engaged with local providers on the ground and the administrators and the citizens within each community and actually target something that was at the top of that list. And so that became a geo-targeted, community-specific opportunity for the learner to be able to say what's going on in this community and maybe in one community it's seatbelt issues or or teen uh, pregnancy risk issues or uh, methamphetamine or other other things that were going on at that time on the top of the list in Idaho and then I got transplanted over to North Dakota and joined a wonderful team to be able to make this happen potentially even on a uh, not only in Idaho and North Dakota, but on a different scale, and, and really the project has taken off with the team from there. I'll take on the next slide. Um, like a lot of projects that I'm involved in, Dr. Schmitz brought me into the fold on this one. 
I worked with Dr. Schmitz on the Community Apgar project a few years, a few years ago, and we're lucky enough to have him here. Um, as he says, transplanted, um, I'd like to say uh, strategically lured to North Dakota. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't long after he started that the tree project hit my desk and it fits really well with the work that I'm already doing as a workforce specialist. So I work at the state office of rural health called the Center for Rural Health in North Dakota. And my main job is to help connect healthcare workforce to rural and underserved communities in, in the state. And this project just fits so well. Um, I work with facilities on their recruitment and retention needs. And then I work with candidates who are looking for rural placement. And I work with students as well to encourage them to either go to or stay in rural practice. And so I'm sure many of you on the call have realized if you're in education at all, um, that encouraging eventual practice in a rural setting uh, starts very early and with great experiences. Um, so tree in my mind, um, you can, is, um, I'm not quite to the next slide yet, but that's all right. Um, tree in my mind is the perfect introduction uh, to a rural community for our students. So it's also perfect for our rural facilities. And I'll tell you why in the next few slides. Um, but when we got started, we knew we needed to do a, a few things first. We needed to market the project to our students. Um, we needed to partner with our rural health association. And we needed to collaborate with the experts already in our office or within reach within our, our School of Medicine and Health Sciences uh, to help the students write their stories. Um, so we came up with a flyer to share around the school, but of course what we've learned is that word of mouth and encouragement from faculty is the number one uh, bestseller of this project. Um, and then luckily in our office, uh, partnering with our Rural Health Association, um, just like I said, we're one big happy family. The office right next door to mine holds the executive director of the North Dakota Rural Health Association. Um, who also helps support our rural health interest group here made up of students. And so they're already um, putting some funding and support in for students interested in a rural health career. And they are now our partner for holding information about the tree project, as well as serving as a library for completed projects. So we can easily go and find the completed articles. They're all in one spot and um, keep those up to date. And then lastly, we use the resources and people that we have available around us to, to support students in their writing projects. So including Kay, who's next to me, who um, has the perfect background and personality for helping students to complete their writing projects. So we can move on to the next slide. So the main components of the project are, as you see on the screen, people, places, writing support, and completed articles. So people, the students who are going to be completing the project, uh, places, which means the rural communities that the students have already had an experience in and that they'll be writing about or who maybe need a rural experience because they want to do this project. We also facilitate some shadowing experiences for them, which I'll get into as well. Uh, the writing support, which Kate will talk about in a bit. And then finally, the completed article, once it's ready to go, supporting them in getting it in that rural newspaper or publication of choice for that particular community. So we can move on to the next slide. I'll just talk about each of these four areas that um, what we've done so far. So starting with students, we started the project um, over a year ago and uh, marketed it mainly to medical students here at the campus of UND. Uh, we have had a, a little bit of a slow start, but it's catching on and as students, more students do it and talk about it with their colleagues, we have more and more interest. Um, and then once Camille and Brian took it or picked up on it, uh, with, who are both associated with the Rome project or Rome program, it's gotten more traction and that excitement um, excites us. Uh, so being located in our medical school is a great advantage. Um, like a small rural town, news spreads in the med school and you maybe don't even know how it got around, but we have uh, piqued the interest of the occupational therapy department now, and we'll have a student completing their um, rural experience this summer and then and following a tree article or a tree project. Um, and so then we're constantly expanding reach to other programs and universities in North Dakota, um, through conversations and connections to hopefully um, have this program catch on at other universities across the state. Next slide. 
Um, talking about places, so um, a requirement of TREE is that a student have um, some kind of rural experience that they can write about. So um, a lot of times they're either doing Rome or have completed Rome, or maybe they have not had a rural experience where uh, that's where I come in with uh, facilitating some of those shadowing experiences. So um, it's not a requirement of TREE that they do RISE, which is Rural Interprofessional Shadowing Experience, but oftentimes those two things go together, um, whether they hear about the writing project first and need a shadowing experience, uh, that's usually the way it goes. And so then, because of my work with rural communities already, I can easily pick up the phone or send a quick email and say, hey, I have a student who is wanting to do a shadowing experience for a day or two or three, would you be willing to take them on? Uh, the facilities love it because a lot of times they're facilities who maybe don't normally have students for a variety of reasons. Um, mostly, as you may know, to have a, a family medicine or a medical student in your facility, you have to have an MD for them to uh, follow or do their clerkship under. And a lot of our rural communities maybe don't have a full-time MD or uh, maybe that MD is traveling to a number of other places, and so they don't have the opportunity to have medical students there for a learning experience. Um, these shadowing experiences that we set up are, you, they can, the student can shadow any provider that the facility feels would be a good fit. So that can be a nurse practitioner, a PA, even a director of nursing we've had happen. And um, the students come back with just wonderful reviews because they wouldn't have otherwise gotten a chance to be in those communities in a learning environment. So, um, so my role in all this is to coordinate um, the shadowing opportunities on behalf of the students. Um, rarely have I had trouble um, setting that up. It's usually one email and it's, it's a done deal. So that uh, just speaks to the relationships that we've formed here in the state and how important that is. Um, so conversely, those who have already done a rural experience can write about, uh, or write about their experience without having to do RISE. So next I'm going to talk, uh, send it over to Kay, who is going to talk about the writing component. Next slide. All right. So I'm going to start by just reviewing the specific steps of my tree role as the writing mentor. After Stacy has connected with the student, I'm next, and my first comments usually center on how impressed I am that they are interested in the project. It takes time that they don't have, and it takes some courage to add yet another thing to their busy schedules. Not all students want to jump into that. So I admire those who come to us and want to at least explore the project. So when we first meet, we briefly discuss their topic choice. To date, all of the tree students have had exceptional amount of passion for what they're doing. And as Stacy mentioned, they get out into those communities and suddenly they are really inspired and motivated by what those clinicians are doing, whether that clinician is a nursing officer, a nurse practitioner, or a physician. So we, we really like that our students are, ex, are exposed to those different providers in rural areas. So they're passionate about their topic. They're passionate about their choice to improve on the information that they've already found on the topic they've chosen. Passion is that key. So another universal pattern I'm seeing here in our, North, in our North Dakota students is that they have not backed away from some really tough topics. Domestic violence, behavioral mental health issues, substance use disorder. These are difficult topics to write about. I've had to write about them myself, so I know what they're jumping into. Let's talk a little bit about deadlines. We don't give them a deadline. Why? We have to remind ourselves that this project is not just an extracurricular project. This is a project that's another ring out from the extracurricular project. They've got enough pressures as students that they don't need us adding a pressure uh, from a deadline. And I'm gonna tell you, the motivated students get this done without a deadline imposed. And as we um, expand our, our program, our project here to some of the things that um, are going to be done with the family medicine, Rome projects, med student projects. 
we'll probably have to re-explore that um, issue about deadlines. So now I want to walk you through one student's effort to uh, success from start to finish. Dr. Sherman heard a third year student do an academic presentation for his family medicine rotation. She immediately recognized the value of that information on farming injuries. She recognized the value that that information would have for the public in the area that the student was um, uh, did their rotation. So she told him, you should consider the tree project. So she got the student in contact with Stacy. Then after Stacy, uh, the student came to me and we were off. Now, the student I mostly communicated by email. And first I had him put the words he used for his academic presentation down on paper. Then I went through and highlighted those areas that I thought should be included in a newspaper article. And then he began, he began translating that information into plain language. I don't talk about health literacy. I don't talk about reading levels because that is no longer what the focus is. The focus is taking our medical information and putting it into plain language. His next drafts included some reorganization, some clarification, and translating words again into plain language. For example, fatality becomes death. 53.5% becomes over half. And with a couple more emails and a couple more segments that needed some revision, he got it ready. Now, once I'm satisfied that, that um, the story is in the shape a newspaper article, a newspaper editor will accept it, then it's up to the student to do the next steps. They need to pitch their story to the newspaper editor or the contact person at the newspaper op op um, office. Um, sometimes the student will have, um, their preceptor will be helpful in that process. Um, sometimes they've done it on their own. So next slide. This is my third year with TREE. Early in the second year, I actually connected with the executive director of the North Dakota Newspaper Association to be able to explain the project. And I asked him if he would just make his membership aware of our, our TREE project. He was really interested in what we were doing and actually suggested ideas for the future. One of those ideas was creating a wire news service and essentially we have a version of that wire service because we host all of the completed student stories on a website. So even if the student does not get published in the newspaper, their completed story is hosted on the North Dakota's Rural Health Association's website. And even though this is not an academic publication, we encourage the students to add that completed project to their CV under the formal publication section because getting a newspaper article is very published is very important. So now that I've been doing this for a while, I wanted to share with you all the four writing suggestions that I make very routinely to the students. Number one, I remind them, you've got to remember who your audience is. And so we work through changing words like low income, adolescent, addiction, to the culturally appropriate words and phrases for the public. Number two, let's take this 65 word sentence and make it into one or two sentences. Number three, write tight. Eliminate all those excess words. Number four, Let's talk about transitions, phrases that move your information from one place to another in a story. So summarizing then, what's in it for the students? Well, TREE gets students exposed to public health data in the community health needs assessments and when they source data for their stories. Um, I like, the, uh, one of our rural researchers always says, with data makes your story credible, but story makes your data memorable. And we always need to keep that in mind when we're working with our lay public folks. It also gives the students an experience in health literacy and plain language that not only applies to the words on the page, but it also applies to what's coming out of their mouths when they're talking with their patients and their families. And of course, the pitch to this, the pitch, when they pitch the story to the newspaper, that involves some leadership activities. They have to see themselves as healthcare leaders networking with their rural newspaper 
communication leaders in order to bring that health information out to a larger rural public audience. What's in it for the writing mentor? I love being the writing mentor because it gives me a chance to teach the students the value of plain language and influence their communication skills. And when they're able to take their first draft and compare it to their last draft, then that theory about plain language is now a reality. And that brings the students a lot of satisfaction. And the last thing I like about being a writing mentor is I'm going to quote another famous teacher. I touch the future, I teach. Next slide. All right. So um, just to kind of uh, wrap up here a little bit more, um, we have taken some steps to make this a requirement now for our, our learners who choose to spend half of their third year in a rural communities, so that's called our Rural Opportunities and Medical Education process. We had double the number of applicants for the spots that we had, so we decided it was a good time to really look at um, what would be a good, a good way to make these students a little more committed to rural, and so we, we do feel that finding a community health need, identifying that, and taking on the writing project is, is not an unreasonable expectation. If if they are privileged enough to be selected for this program, it's a nice way for them to give back to their communities. It's an excellent mechanism for these students to talk with their teaching physicians and say, hey, let's dig into these community health needs. They do not have to use the community health needs assessment. If they come across a seasonal issue, like every farmer during spring's work is working too many hours, and that could lead to some accidents, they can choose something like that. If they come across um, an access issue for their patients or they come across an issue within a family that seems to be more of a rural challenge than an urban challenge, we encourage them to really keep their minds open to look at something that could be a good thing to target and educate their community about. We do try to promote this as a kind of an awareness project and a service uh, leadership opportunity. We have made this interprofessional. So as you heard, we have an occupational therapy student who's interested. We do some other interprofessional activities, um, including some with our uh, North Dakota State University College of Pharmacy. I think that would be low hanging fruit if students would want to start addressing things like addiction treatment and the medical assisted treatments for that. Certainly that would be relevant and rural. Um, and also um, we just really want to remind all of you um, joining us today that this really is a great time to get involved. We are actually fortunate enough to be presenting this targeted rural health education piece at the, um, rural, at the World Rural Health Conference that will be coming up in Albuquerque in October. So we're really trying to use this even internationally through working with Rural Wonka that should allow um, rural communities from across the globe to have an opportunity for our student learners to find an issue, address it, and get that back to the local people. Um, I believe it's Dr. Miller Temple who has a really good statistic. I think it's something like 80% of people in rural communities do have access to, to written information like newspapers. So um, certainly we think that using the, the newspaper is a good route. As we go forward, there might be some other um, social media sorts of ways to promote things like this. But for now, we really value the, the written language in the newspaper and that leadership piece of connecting a medical student with a newspaper editor is a really unique opportunity for them to grow from and learn from as well. And so we, you have all of our contact information here. We certainly are always happy to work with our colleagues nationally and internationally. And with that, I think Dr. Schmitz had a few more words of wisdom for the group and we are then welcoming questions. Well, thanks Camille. Uh, words of wisdom is, a, is quite a, a transition, but I'll just say, um, you know, admittedly, as a 29-year-old uh, board-certified family physician, when I arrived in my little town of St. Mary's, Idaho, I'm not sure I knew what all of the community needs were. I had uh, been doing a project around uh, immunizations, and I figured, well, that must be what they need. And I found out we had a, a great immunization rate in what was otherwise a very challenged uh, socioeconomic status, third poorest county in the state at the time, and very rural and isolated. So, you know, I think having students have the opportunity uh, during a preceptorship 
to uh, understand what community needs assessments are, how to utilize them, how to be culturally and contextually uh, sensitive and appropriate, and then transmitting information and leading in that community. Um, boy, and when you've got to put words to the page and then have it published, you know, hopefully along with some local support, um, does that mean even when the student leaves that that theme can be picked up by the local community and some of the local providers and carried forward? And what does that mean for student engagement and understanding that when they show up at their first job after residency completion or after um, their interprofessional or their professional training has come to a close, I hope that they'll be better prepared than I was. Um, and I think that's part of, um, of this uh, project. So we certainly hope that it will continue to not only grow, but evolve. Um, we're open to your ideas of what we haven't thought of, what we could be doing next or doing differently. One of the things that we did architecturally do on purpose was to work specifically with the Rural Health Association, which can be seen as a, a state affiliated chapter of the National Rural Health Association. So we've been working with the NRHA, if you're familiar with that group, um, to look at, um, again, having this happen in the United States. And then now um, it would, should be interesting to see if we could empower uh, communities to be able to do this internationally. Um, at the University of North Dakota, we do host a uh, webpage for Rural Wonka. And so we have an opportunity to work with the Global Association of Family Physicians and General Practitioners, Wonka, to be able to potentially have a, not only a national library, but an international library, depending on how that goes in our meeting this fall. So we hope that you will be uh, uh, inspired to uh, perhaps jump on board. Um, I know that our team would like to at UND continue to facilitate what you might be able to do at your own institution or in your own state with regard to being uh, and training the future advocates for rural community health, and then potentially uh, network with us around what other creative ideas you may have in taking the project forward in particular ways. So with that, I will turn it back to Davis, our facilitator, for some discussion. Sure, and before I, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here in a moment. Before I do that, I just, I do wanna sort of reinforce the website um, on tree there at the top of that slide. Um, if you visit there, you'll see the articles and a really um, useful toolkit to help you um, to, to help you do this if you want to set this up. Um, so let me just share my screen here and get us into the discussion. Okay. There we go. So um, I don't see any questions yet in the chat box, um, but please do, if you have questions, um, enter them in the, in the chat box and um, you can either send them to the panelists or you can send them to everybody um, and we will uh, monitor that and get back to you. Um, until, until we do hear from some folks, I, I have a couple of questions of my own um, and, and Dave also feel free to jump in. Um, but I guess my first, um, question would be, um, as I mentioned, that toolkit is really helpful for anybody that wants to start a program or tips for the students themselves, um, you know, for writing and publishing that, um, that Kay was going over there. Um, and so let's say I want to start this program. Um, what could you describe, like, what would be the minimum requirements to do this? Um, and that would be in terms of organizational resources or staff, kinds of staff. Um, and I particularly mention this because, you know, North Dakota is well resourced when it comes to um, rural health uh, in many ways. And so, um, so I'm not at all surprised to see that this got going there um, in, in your state. But, but what would you say, you know, uh, would be the minimum um, to get this going? I can answer that. I think um, a lot of times Kay will put the focus on me, but it's definitely uh, more. It should go on her. So if I was not part of it, the program would still work with just Kay because I think that is the crux of the project is the writing process. Um, yes, I help with getting them rural experiences, but a lot of times maybe they have it through a different program like Rome, for example, or family medicine clerkship, but I don't have the writing expertise to help them take what they experienced through the lens of a community health needs assessment and put it in plain language. So 
my opinion is that the, the bare minimum is having some kind of writing expert or writing mentor or someone who can help them uh, put their thoughts on paper in a, in a way that the public will understand. And I'll follow that up with saying you don't have to have uh, a physician that happens to have a master's in journalism. That's kind of rare. What you do need is any healthcare provider, and I really think it does help for the students to have an experienced healthcare provider because they've got that street cred of having taken care of patients and being and using plain language on a regular basis. You need to find that healthcare provider who has a passion for writing in plain language. So not the ones that are academically publishing a lot, though some of those folks do have that skill set to write in plain language, but look at folks who have done some blogs or some, maybe you have, um, if you're connected with community colleges, a lot of times community colleges have some really good writing uh, courses and maybe there's a help provider who has stepped in to help. Uh, to, to have filled in, in those roles. I think, um, again, the, the, probably the most important thing about your writing mentor is somebody who is passionate about that role too. I love doing this because it's just so important to um, providing health care to patients is knowing how to communicate with them in very plain language. And the other thing, Davis, this is Dave, I would just say is that while, while Stacy is being humble about her role, and then I'll pass it to Camille as well, um, I think that the community connection and engagement is really critical. Um, part of this was based off some experiences I had had in rural communities working as a medical educator where we were um, taking on specific and somewhat difficult uh, issues such as adolescent suicide, methamphetamine use. Um, at the time, we had a lot of methamphetamine use. And so, you know, you don't want to be the person who drove a couple hundred miles from, you know, an urban based university, or in my case, it was a residency, you know, you're not just going to show up in town and sort of, you know, you know, give them, quote, unquote, wisdom, and then leave, you know, no, this is their community. Um, you broke up there a little bit, Dave. I think Stacy has a, amazing connections throughout the state um, and also um, is able to encourage the students uh, to be able to engage those communities appropriately. Camille, do you want to take that? Sure. And so the, the other piece of this as the um, Family Medicine Clerkship Director and the Coordinator for our Rural Opportunities and Medical Education piece I also have let the teaching facilitators in our communities know that our medical students have a new requirement and they should be working with their teaching faculty docs to identify a need about which they can write. And so as, as we open that up, maybe we'll be lucky enough to even have some community docs decide that they would like to try a project or, or write something. And I, I'm certainly confident that our, our writing experts would work with anybody who wants to write. Um, maybe I'll take a swing at one. And it might be something about health education in rural areas because there are some unique challenges out here. So I think as long as we let students have a good amount of freedom to choose a topic about which they are really interested, but maybe by spurring their teaching physicians and, and others in their healthcare facilities to work on this, we might get some more interest. The other piece of this that should continue to grow, we by design, have our new medical school in Grand Forks that's been open now for a couple of years, encouraging interprofessional mingling of students all the time. Um, their, their lounge areas and their study areas are all interconnected. And so perhaps as we get students writing more and Stacy is getting these students out for first and second year experiences when they're all on the main campus, even in those conversations, like Stacy mentioned, you never really know in a med school by word of mouth how something gets around. So I think our, our hope would be to welcome learners of any discipline to find a topic. And the other piece of North Dakota medical education that may or may not come through on a webinar, we have a lot of dedicated students really loyal to their hometown area or their home communities. And so I think if they find an issue and feel passionate about that, if we can channel that toward doing a writing piece that really might make them feel like they are giving back to their communities. And they would also be, of course, 
enriching our library and our repository on the topics that have come up across rural North Dakota. So I, I do think that this is another mechanism to really build teams. So I, I think it is a nice project and I think it will continue to grow. I did invite our residency program directors from our North Dakota Family Medicine residencies today to this webinar. I don't know if they're on the meeting, but as part of that, I said, and if you don't make the webinar, please talk with me and we can try to keep connecting you with personnel that could have residents do some writing as well. Have we had any residents write an article yet? I know we've had interested uh, residents yes. and they yes. did. Yeah. The other thing I, I so, guess I'm just seeing, oh, go ahead, a couple of cautions. One is, of course, you want to try to um, have um, medically correct information that is transmitted that's important. Um, and so also that needs to be kept up to date. And so, you know, I don't think you just want to take the, um, you know, take, take sort of the package of how to do this and, and, and have not, some of these caveats not covered. But one is, um, you know, the, the, the information should be correct. It should be evidence-based uh, standard of care and it, and it should be thought out with regard to how patients interpret medical information and advisement um, and update it. The other is that I think that some of the issues are very uh, sensitive, you know, such as uh, let's take domestic violence as an example. But I think in the same sense for our students to be able to learn how to communicate about difficult issues uh, within the context of a small town breaks down some of those barriers that otherwise um, rural students wonder like, well, how could I ever talk about domestic violence or other difficult issues in a small town? Well, this is a good opportunity to figure out how to frame the discussion and be able to have those important points. Um, um, because, because I can tell you from my six years in a town of 2000 people, you need to learn how to be able to frame those discussions and, 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 and have those conversations. So, so again, I think that um, there are definitely um, contextual considerations around how to deliver this product um, in that, if you will call it that, um, into your community setting. And, and that's why I think we'd like to sh share our practice or our example with other institutions and with other state rural health associations. And I think it could come from either side. I think if you were in uh, another state and you are listening from the State Office of Rural Health or, or the Rural Health Association, call up your universities and say, hey, who can do the tree? You know, and if you're uh, one of the uh, institutions educating health professionals, please consider linking up with your rural health association and, and then perhaps we can be uh, organizing this and working together with our lessons learned. Well, thank you. This, this is a great discussion. And I, um, I wanted to just uh, sort of reinforce or, or um, say that the uh, idea of uh, encouraging rural preceptors or other rural um, community providers to, to do this, it, it sounds like a great idea and expansion uh, of this because that way they're actually um, modeling those leadership roles in their community that you're hoping your students are going to see too. So um, I thought that sounded like a great idea. I do want to, we do have a couple of questions coming through and I, the first one um, was about who is your most foundational contact at your local newspaper and I'd like you to, um, to respond to that and I might also just like to broaden it to think about um, you know, media contacts are just gold, I think, for this kind of an activity. Um, and so what media channels have you explored? And one of the things, you know, that I, I thought about is um, what about the University of North Dakota public relations folks? I don't know if you mentioned them, um, but, you know, every school and, of course, the, the health, rural health associations have their own sort of media um, arms as well. And so if you could talk about um, your experience in engaging the media, um, and but start with this idea of the local newspaper, um, how you how you do that. So um, there, in the chat box is a question, who was your most foundational contact at your local newspaper? I would say the editor. You need to go to the top um, and make your case for what you'd like to do. Again, it's a community leadership position communication leader with health leader, and that would be my recommendation. And I can build off of that 
question and Kay's answer that um, I think we've learned a little bit that we made a lot of assumptions that rural newspapers will just pick this up and it wouldn't be um, any kind of issue whatsoever. And in some communities, we found it to be an easy pathway, but in, in some other communities, we found it to be a little bit more challenging. Um, the rural communities that have those uh, personal connections where maybe the editor is their son's baseball coach or their cousin or something, um, those are real easy. And I think maybe most states can relate to that they have those types of rural communities. Um, in others, it's a harder sell where uh, maybe the story's been with the editor for a few weeks and there hasn't been anything published yet. Um, Katie did mention right at the beginning that we took some actions to um, go to the, the statewide uh, newspaper association and let them know about this project so that if it did come across the desk of a local newspaper's editor, perhaps the statewide association has um, maybe laid the foundation for us there. So um, the trickle down hasn't quite happened all the way yet, but we're there and we're, we're still um, kind of knocking on the door to continue sharing, at least to make TREE a little bit more recognizable as a project. And then I think also just the uh, organic approach. You know, when this project began in Idaho, I was doing it with resident physicians who are on required rural rotations. And I actually encouraged them to talk to their preceptor or the hospital CEO, figure out who in the community could you ask, hey, I've got to, I want to write something about educating the community about this health concern. Who should I go talk to? And it was really interesting because in some cases, the preceptor or the hospital administrator knew exactly who to talk to, and in some cases, not so much. And then I had actually had them call up that person and say, you know, I see you come out with an article, I mean, with a, with a, you're, it's a once weekly publication on Wednesdays and you have a health column. If I was to write for that, how many words should it be? 200 or 300 words? You know, so they actually, we just actually had them call. And that was, again, based off some rural provider experiences I had had around starting a volunteer clinic in my little town of St. Mary's and then having the newspaper interested in writing a couple of articles about what was going on in town. And so we were just kind of originating the conversation in the other way, but again, not as a um, sort of student on their own, but perhaps as, uh, as it transitions to this next question from our audience, um, empowering the local team to carry this forward. Because once the student or learner goes home, you want it to have a lasting impact. And the only way to do that is to have uh, local champions who are permanent parts of that community. Yeah, and let's let's um, take this this next question, which I think is a great question. Um, you know, wh when you're looking at community health needs assessment, sort of the the, the emphasis on, is on the need, um, and um, and so this question asks, um, what about an asset based approach? And have you considered incorporating a strengths or asset based framework for these uh, writing opportunities to empower community members? Um, to be part of improving health in their community um, based on, on that asset um, uh, or strength approach. I'm not sure if I'm interpreting the question correctly or not, but one of the things that I'll share is as the students are writing their story, I advise, it, advise them that you always conclude your story with a throw to the future. So as someone who has been in the community, you're going to look around and see the supports in that community. And um, uh, for example, um, even throw out that, um, well, I'm getting kind of lost here, but I, I can't think of how the farming injury story had actually ended now that I'm, th but it was a throw to the future about how there could be an ongoing effort about being careful in the springtime when you're a farmer. So the other, the other interesting piece that happened with that, the student actually went out and had a tractor ride around the field with, with a, a farmer that may have had an accident. So it did kind of connect right back full circle there. And I think the other thing, too, is that what students can learn or what we can all learn, especially if we're not 
a part of that community, we're new to the community, is that rural communities have a lot of resources in the sense that they've learned how to figure things out, you know. And so we always make sure that the articles predominantly and very carefully are relevant to the rural community, to a rural site. Let me give an example. Um, uh, one, a physician, resident physician who I was working with in Idaho uh, was, was doing an article on getting a proper amount of exercise and how that could uh, help diabetic patients or all of us really, but could particularly help lower the uh, glucose levels of diabetic patients getting regular exercise. But the town, it was very cold there, you know, in the winter time. And, um, and so it was an issue of, well, how do you get that exercise safely, especially if it's icy outside? And the typical um, response, as you might imagine, in a city might be, well, you just go to the mall and you walk around the inside of the mall. Well, that's, that's not really great advice for this small town, uh, it, which doesn't have a mall. And so, so I think that how, how do you learn the answer to that question? You can actually ask people in town, you know, and, and you might find out that there is a senior citizen walking group that's, or, or exercise group that's figured out how to do something to get around that issue. And so I think sometimes uh, asking the questions while you're in the community about how the community is already addressing um, some of these difference, differences in a rural or resource limited context, and then um, talking about that good news story to help address a serious health concern in that community is empowering. So, so again, it's not just lending your expertise, quote unquote, or the words of wisdom. It's really a community engaged approach to understand how that community is addressing and could be addressing uh, an issue that's important. Okay. I think we have time for one or two more questions um, with no others in the chat box. I was curious about um, sort of the community expectations around this and and I imagine with different projects um, there'll be you know different kinds of people and different numbers of people that are engaged in in the community um, in developing these stories um, and you mentioned also I'll connect that to no deadlines uh, and you don't know if it's actually going to be published locally or not. Um, so I'm wondering um, what sort of community expectations you set around these um, writing projects and what, what, do, what can they expect to receive regardless of whether it gets in the paper or not, or you know, what's the follow-up um, outcome once the article's written? Um, so I think from the aspect of whether or not a facility engages more, if there's an article potential at the end, I think the answer is yes. If I am, say, setting up a, a shadowing experience and I say, oh, by the way, this student is interested in, in a tree project, here's what tree is. In the end, we might have an article about you. So they're looking at it as I could potentially have promotion that I don't have to create myself, but I'm invested in it because I want us to sound good and look good and, and be participatory. And so they'll encourage their providers to take part in the article, whether it's by being interviewed or helping the student form the article or is the way that they're looking at this particular community health need, the way that that community sees it. Uh, so I think there's more engagement when the potential of having essentially a promotional piece uh, there is, is there. So I don't know if you have anything else to add about that. Hopefully that answers your question, Davis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, we're about five minutes to the hour and I wanted to wrap up um, so that we, we have an evaluation, but first I wanted to um, uh, talk about upcoming events. Um, so next month we will have um, a webinar on July 25th about negotiating the IRB process. And so this is really geared toward um, students and uh, educators that are um, working around doing uh, rural health research um, and some of the challenges um, in doing, trying to do research in rural places. Um, and uh, we're also looking for future presenters and topics for, for either our um, professional development webinars like this or Rural Prep Grand Rounds, um, which is our um, educational content for um, students and residents um, in, in training. And so you can contact us there. 
um, at our email address, and I'll also give you our individual uh, project leadership email addresses at the end. Um, and uh, but before we get there, um, I want I would like to ask for an evaluation, and and I guess what I'd like to say is thank you so much to uh, Stacy K and Camille and and Dave. Um, I think this is a, a fabulous. Uh, project and um, really appreciate your uh, sharing that with us today. So um, if uh, folks could take a minute to do the evaluation um, and we've saved time for that. Um, and so there's a link in the chat box that you can easily click on. Um, also, there's a QR code if that uh, works for you easily or you can type the, the address into your browser. But um, please take a moment to do that. I'll leave the slide up for a minute, um, and again, you have the link in the chat box. Um, and then uh, in a minute, I'll give you the contact information for myself, um, the project director for Rural Prep, um, as well as uh, Dave Schmitz and Randy Longenecker, who, who, who's on vacation and couldn't join us today, um, but he's the associate project director. And we're happy to hear from you with um, questions or comments or follow up to this webinar or if you have ideas for topics for future webinars um, and, and um, really anything to help us improve our offerings. So I'll switch over to that slide. There's our email addresses. And um, we will give you um, a couple minutes here to do the evaluation. And, and then that will be the conclusion of our webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.